So here's an example video to get distance versus time data from your car. I have the floor taped off. If you don't want to tape off the floor, you can just mark your tire and use the circumference to see how far it's gone. Get as much data off your video as you can so you can get a nice smooth curve. Okay, so now we're going to go into the homework tables, and I'm grabbing that fourth table as just an example. I'm going to replace the example data in it with the distance versus time data I got off of that video. Okay, so here is a scatter plot. I'm going to add some axis titles. Oops. And then right click, add trend line, put a third order polynomial, be sure to display equation on chart. And this equation is what I'm going to use to create my smoothed position data. So wherever I see an X, I'm clicking on time because time is on my X axis here. Be sure and get that equation typed in correctly. So the new smooth data should look very similar to the older data when you're done with it. Calculating velocity from position versus time data. So we know that velocity is change in position over change in time. And if my position versus time curve is linear, then that's a very straightforward calculation. If it's nonlinear, as is in our case, we're going to have to use some averaging. So remember, position is the area underneath velocity versus time curve. So if I have two different velocities, the velocity is changing which means the slope on my position versus time curve is changing, which is in our case. What we have here is essentially kind of a triangular area. So area under the curve is position and a rectangular area. This triangle, this is V2 minus V1 over T2 minus T1, and it's a triangle. So one half base times height. One half, here's the height is the difference in velocities and the base is the difference in times. And then I'm going to add the area of this triangle to the area of the rectangle, which is has a height of V1 and a base of the difference in times. So combining this, I can say I have 1 half minus V1 plus V1. It ends up being kind of an average of those two velocities. So 1 half V2 plus V1. And you can see how just grabbing the average of that, so I could make one rectangle here where that rectangle is the average height between V2 and V1. So X, the position, is equal to the area under the velocity curve, which is an average of those two velocities times the difference in time. Rearranging this, so I have position, I have time, I want to know my velocity. To get my velocity, I'm going to have to take two times my change in distance, over my change in time minus that preceding velocity. I do need boundary conditions here. So this is the one of the things to clean up your data is to make sure you have a good starting velocity. And that means analyzing the starting slope of your position versus time data. OK, so now comes the real tricky part, and that is trying to get decent velocity versus time and acceleration versus time. So I'm using that trick of 2 times x2 minus x1 divided by t2 minus t1 minus the starting velocity. I'm going to start it at 0 at this point, but it does not start at 0. I'm going to have to really play around with those top two cells, my starting velocity to get something that's OK. And you can see the blue line is from the data that's not smoothed, and it is a complete mess. The orange line is from the smooth data. And after you play around with it and play around with it for a long time, you can finally get something that looks like it should look. So the velocity increases until the trap sets, and then it decreases as it coasts to a rest due to frictional forces. So it should kind of go up and then back down again, but you're going to have to really mess around with that starting velocity to get anything that looks like a nice curve. OK, acceleration, same thing. If velocity is not linear, then you're going to have to use that averaging trick to get acceleration. Just like change in position is area under velocity curve, 
change in velocity is the area under the acceleration curve. So that same trick works. And once again, we're going to have to really mess around with the starting acceleration. Now, I wasn't able to get a perfect velocity curve here, so acceleration is not looking good. So I might have to go back and actually smooth out my velocity data just like I smoothed out my position data. So here we go. We're going to add a trend line now to our velocity data and take that polynomial equation, type it in to create a new data set for velocity. And it almost feels like a little bit of fudging to do this, but realize this air propagation stuff, it is real. And very small errors turn into big errors. We know what that trend is supposed to be, and we'll get a lot better information off of this trend line. The slopes, it doesn't take very much scatter for those slopes to just get out of control. And um, when you're basing information on one graph on the slope of the previous graph, it's you really have to clean it up well. So this is the final what the original data should look like. So hopefully this will really teach you the importance of getting high quality data when you're doing experimentation of understanding physically what's happening in your system so that you can analyze that data correctly and know what the trend lines are supposed to look like and deal with error propagation. And when you get to taking your calculus classes, you'll see some where those are going to be applied in the future because that's areas under curves and slopes of lines become extremely important in all of the fields of engineering.